so much for coming out. Give it up for yourselves for being out on a rainy February night. So first off, this is going to be an amazing event. We have a great lineup of comedians for you this evening. I want to start by thanking the venue, Gold Lion, for helping us make this event possible. So we raised over a thousand dollars for RV Community Fridges! With that, let's turn it over to the founder of RV Community Fridges, Taylor Scott. Hi everybody. Oh my god! First of all, yeah, give, our, give yourself a round of applause again because you all are not enough to not have that actually, so I'm gonna like not. Can you all in the back hear me? Yeah? Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate you all coming here supporting the Bridges, but not only us, like local comedians, like from afar and near, like really love that. I'm excited for the stand up tonight because I've actually not heard anyone here today, so like. It's really new to me and I love getting involved with community and new people and it's just a great way. So if you have a suggestion of what we should buy with a thousand dollars that you all help us make for tonight or what we should cook when we have our next community cook day this coming Friday at Matchbox, which is our free food mutual aid kitchen, let me know. I'll be in the front but I'll also be walking around. You can also DM it to us however you see fit, my friends, but we'd love to have them so we can fill the fridges, but also like fill local bellies and like have close community care. I really appreciate you all coming out tonight and have a great laugh. Keep it going for Taylor Scott. We're going to just talk about a few housekeeping things. So there is a two drink minimum tonight. So if you haven't gotten your drink already, go ahead, go to the bar and grab one. Uh, you're welcome to get up throughout the show and grab your drink. We have a couple specialty cocktails tonight. We have the Mutual Aid Mango Margarita, which is alcoholic. And we have the Frigid Russian, which is going to be our mocktail option this evening. And it is uh, a pineapple flavored drink. Can everyone hear me in the back? Give me a thumbs up. Yay. OK, good. Um, another few things to note are we have some great bowls if you're looking to have dinner tonight. They have a butter chicken option, a tofu sog, and an alu, alu gobi. So um, great food, great drinks. We're so happy you're here. So who's been to a comedy show before? Give me a woo. Nice. Okay. For those of you who haven't, we're going to kind of talk through what to expect and um, we're going to get the show started. So, who knows what you do if you really like a joke you've heard? Laugh. <laughs> exactly, y'all got it. Um, so at the count of three, we're all gonna practice our heartiest belly jiggling laugh. All right, everyone ready? Okay. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, this is where crowds are a little bit less sure. What do you do if you hear a joke you don't really like tonight? That might happen. You're not going to get up and say, excuse me, I don't really like that type of humor here. What you're going to do instead is you're going to stare daggers into the comic's eye. And if a comic receives silence as a response to their joke, they know to never tell that joke again. Can we do that? Okay, amazing. Now, I don't think any of the comics are going to be doing crowd work tonight, but if they do, we do have a little safe word in place. If you all do not want to engage in the crowd work, just say, I'm shy, and they'll move on. So we've got a great lineup of comedians tonight, a very diverse um, set of people, and they're going to be amazing. I think there's something for everyone here tonight. You're going to love it. I'm so happy y'all are here. So I'm the first comedian of the night. I'll tell you a little bit about me. Growing up, I was a confused child. I did not know that, no I thought knocked up meant getting drunk. <laughs> so at my eighth grade graduation, I told all my friends that the night before, me and my brother got knocked up. <laughs> Embarrassing. Um, and 
My brother was so dumb growing up. This is your cue to ask how dumb was he? How dumb was he? He was so dumb, he insisted we eat rotten fruit because it was fermented and we would get drunk. <laughs> so you ever spend the night eating rotten fruit with your brother? <laughs> Only to go into school the next day and tell everyone you got knocked up? and popular kid, what can I say? <laughs> Another little confusion I had was I did not know the difference between the words tourist and terrorist. <laughs> yup. <laughs> and one day, I grew up in the DC suburbs, one day my mom sits us all down at the table and she says, look, I know we live here, I know we love it here, but this weekend we're going into Washington DC, the nation's capital, and we're gonna be complete tourists. <laughs> I was horrified. She said, we're gonna hit the museums. We're gonna hit the monuments. And for a grand finale, we're hitting the White House. Now I grew up during the Bush administration, y'all. I was a no child left behind kid. So I looked my mother in the eyes and I said, how dare you? I for one love this country. I love this country much that after graduating high school, instead of going to college right away, I ended up being a congressional intern. And in my experience doing that, I had this weird experience where security would always wave me by. They'd be like, you're so humble. Oh my gosh, why are you waiting in line for security? They would never pat me down. They would never make me go through the metal detector. And I was a 19-year-old intern. So I was like, who do y'all think I am? And then one day, Hillary Clinton is walking by with her Indian chief of staff, Huma Abedin. They look at Huma, they look at me, they look at Huma, they look at me, and they go, if that's Huma Abedin, who the heck are you? I think I'm a little bit of an ethnic Rorschach test. Like, you know those splotch patterns they show people in uh, psych offices? Like, you see what you want to see? One time when I was living in Brooklyn, this man stopped me and put both of his hands on my uh, shoulders, looked me in the eyes and said, excuse me, is it just me or are we both Jewish? <laughs> and it was just him. <laughs> We're in that time of year where the weather's cold, it's like 30 degrees outside. Who here's feeling a little depressed? Yeah, yeah. Um, I recently told my boss at work, I was like, hey, I'm depressed, I need a little time off. And he was like, Tara, you know, when I'm depressed, the only thing that gets me through it is doing overtime at work and putting in, the, <laughs> putting in those extra hours. It's about as believable as me saying that the only time I can come is when I'm deep throating someone. <laughs> Do y'all know what a James River jellyfish is? It's just a used condom. <laughs> and boy, is our ecosystem thriving. So, um, I'm bi. Thank you. And when I tell people I'm bi, they're like, Tara, do you mean you're bilingual, bipolar, or bisexual? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I use they, them pronouns because I want you to be as confused about my gender as I am. Yeah, like, let's spread that around, right? It seems only fair. Um, RuPaul once said that we're born naked and everything else is drag, and I really believe that. But um, even though I use they, them pronouns, I end up getting she, they a lot. I think mainly by cis guys who want to she, them titties. <laughs> In 2020, as a non-binary person, I was on testosterone for about six months, and my doctors were like, okay, you know, you can start to expect to look like your closest male relative. And I was like, oh, I think I'm good, actually. I don't know if I want to be balding in an incel. So here we are. Um, and who here's on the dating apps? Yeah, it's a very tentative woo. It's very tentative, because it is brutal out there on the dating apps. Recently, someone messaged me and told me I look like a fat Mia Khalifa. Yeah, it's okay. Um, my friends tell me
told me I looked like a squishmallow come to life, which I think is a little more believable. Thank you. But I just downloaded Bumble, and maybe y'all can help me figure it out. I really don't get it. When I downloaded the app, they were like, women have to message first. And I was like, okay, so if it's a straight thing, the woman messages first, got it. In a lesbian dynamic, either woman can message first. But do gay men just not get to message at all? <laughs> Let me tell you a little story. When I was in the first grade, my grandma took me to get a super short pixie cut. And when I walked into the first day of the first grade, the kid sitting across from me took one look at me and he was like, with that haircut, you look like a lesbian. And I was like, what's a lesbian? He told me it's when two girls meet and fall in love and get married. And I was like, that could really work for me. <laughs> so I proceed to start killing it with the ladies in the first grade, okay? I am absolutely flirting with everyone, having a great time. And a few months later, this kid comes up to me and he's like, look, it really backfired calling you a lesbian. I was just trying to make conversation because I have a huge crush on you and I wanted to impress you. Let me show you how much you mean to me. And then he takes a stapler and he staples his hand. So men, that's the bar now. Oh, you're interested in me? Maim yourself. Prove to me how much I really mean to you. Who here's in therapy? Give it up. We got some well-adjusted people in the room tonight. Love that. So I'm in therapy, and my therapist and I get along so well that it's a real risk that we run into each other in public. We share a lot of the same interests. And she told me, she's like, look, it's totally cool if we run into each other. You're welcome to come up and say hi, even if I'm with people. The only thing is people can't know I'm your therapist, so just make up a reason for how we know each other. Oh boy. I like to get creative with this. Every time I see her, I make up a different reason. I saw her at a festival recently, and I was like, Sarah, it is so good to see you. I haven't seen you since you were hospitalized for bathing in the James River. <laughs> she did not like that. But someone's got to keep her on her toes, right? <laughs> Anyone um, come from a broken home, children of divorce, maybe children of divorce in the house tonight? <laughs> My people. When I was a kid, my parents got divorced really young, and in elementary school, they had a club for us kids um, called Banana Splits. <laughs> yep, for children of divorce. And you know, we would get together and play board games. But on the last day of school, they ended up actually giving us all Banana Splits. And those other kids were so jealous. Because what's better when you're eight years old? Having parents that love each other or ice cream with bananas? <laughs> I will end on this one. This is a story called I'll Smoke With Anybody Once. <laughs> now this is not great life advice if you want to, you know, continue to live another day. But it's got me into some interesting situations. One time in San Diego, um, a group of indigenous people brought me into their circle. We passed around a beautifully rolled joint, and they said, from one Indian to another, let's blaze. Yeah. Beautiful moment I'll never forget. Now let me tell you another story that makes me grateful that two white women are not narrating the tale of my demise on a true crime podcast. <laughs> so when I was a bushy-tailed 22-year-old, um, I was working in Florida, and someone messages me on the work Slack and they say, hey, you seem cool. Do you want to smoke weed and grab dinner after work? And I was like, yeah, Florida man. I have no stranger danger. Why not? So he pulls his car around and I open the passenger door and I look inside and there are bottles filled with yellow liquid. And I go, is that pee? And he looks at me and he goes, I know, right? I get in the vehicle. <laughs> we get to the restaurant and he goes, you want to smoke some weed? And I say, but of course. 
So he pulls out a Darth Vader shaped bong. And I say, I can't help but notice in your glove compartment, was that a gun? And he looks at me and he goes, I know, right? <laughs> I still went to dinner with this guy. I have no survival instinct, but I live to tell the tale and I'm so grateful to be here with y'all tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. We have a great show. Um, I'm gonna bring up our first comic of the evening. This person is very funny. She is one third of the Hearst Girls, which is an improv group, and they also run a monthly-ish comedy show. Um, she's very funny. She's performed up and down the East Coast. Let's give it up for Amber Hendricks. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Give it up for Tara one more time. Yeah, and RVA Community Fridges, right? Clap it up for uh, mutual aid, right? Very important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are my irritable bowel babies at? Yeah, my IBS girlies? Or as I like to call us, little bowel owls. Yeah. Um, if you have a fucked up GI system, right? Like you're kind of surprised that other people in the world do not, right? Like, I was filling out paperwork for a vaccine recently. We don't have to get into which one. Uh, it was for rabies, okay? I'm considered high risk, okay? Um, but there was a question on this paperwork, okay? And it was like, have you had diarrhea in the last seven days? And check boxes for yes or no. And I was like, whoa, there are people on this planet <laughs> who are confidently checking no. And I have had diarrhea in the last seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> Check the waiting room. I'm having it right now. Okay. Um, I used to live up in New York City. People have heard of it. Yeah, a few people. It's a cool place, right? If you want to check it out. No rush, but cool. Yeah, uh, took public transportation, as you do, right? Like, tried to keep to myself, and I was on the subway one day, and this man was, like, muttering, and he was becoming increasingly agitated, and I was like, okay, don't look at him. Don't look at him. Do not look at him. And I looked at him. Okay. <laughs> And he was looking at me. <laughs> and he pointed and said, yeah, I'm talking about you. You arts and crafts motherfucker. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fair. <laughs> I feel seen. Um, I do get up to New York pretty frequently. I have a niece and nephew there. They also have parents. Who cares, <laughs> right? Parents are not cute, all right? I love my niece and nephew. My nephew is 11 now, okay? And he has a cell phone, which, yeah, I feel like down here, like, that's not as typical, but he's walking himself to school every day, like a mile there, a mile back. A lot of protective apps on this cell phone. But he took the cell phone, okay? And he set up a three-generation family group chat. Really cute, right? And he did this using the Signal app. Yeah, are people familiar? Maybe, a couple people, they don't want to admit it, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you're not familiar, it's just a free messaging app that's like encrypted end to end. And we're like, all right, what does he want to talk about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should we be worried? On the day that Queen Elizabeth died, okay, my nephew was the first one to alert the group chat. <laughs> Totally true story, okay? He did this by writing, in all caps, the queen is dead, it is about time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my mother, his grandmother, okay, she wrote back, okay, <laughs> I know that her family is responsible for some bad things. <laughs> But I like to think of her as she was most recently. Just an older lady who loved animals. Okay. 
hot take from my mom, right? My nephew did not miss a beat, okay? I wrote back, loving horses and corgis does not make up for generations of genocide and colonialism. And I responded, fire emoji. <laughs> Fire emoji, fire emoji. Because that is a fire take. And also the queen is in hell. Okay. <laughs> Later that night, I DM'd my nephew, okay? Via the Signal app, let's keep it secure. <laughs> Sent him some writings by an Italian Marxist. I said, hey, you may be interested in the concept of cultural hegemony. <laughs> and my nephew wrote back, yo, I'm 11. <laughs> I'll get him later, right? I'll wait till he gets his first minimum wage job, okay? Um, do people remember the first pandemic of the 21st century? Mm. Yes. Yes, okay, maybe. Yeah, no, there's some really good answers out there, but I don't know. <laughs> Let me take you back to September 2014, okay? When everybody with an iTunes account woke up to an unsolicited download of a U2 album. <laughs> yeah. And in his official apology, because this was very controversial, right? Like people were rightfully upset. In his official apology on Facebook, Bono did say, oops, right? Oops. Yeah, and I haven't figured out how to finish this joke yet. And let me just be totally candid with that and open. Um, but some of you may not have had devices at that time, all right? We are nearing the 10th anniversary, so grief is not linear. <laughs> For some of us, it's like it was just yesterday. <laughs> um, so be kind to us, okay, in a few months. Um, the name of that album, does anybody remember? Songs of Innocence, okay. Yuck, okay. All right, I'm working on that joke. <laughs> Anybody watching Love is Blind? Yes! Yes! Yes, yes. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, season six. All right, we got one in the front row watching it, one dedicated watcher. Anybody else? Couple? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're in. You Okay, yeah. It's okay, you can admit it. Like, it's fine. Like, we can do a lot of good things and also still watch Love is Blind. <laughs> Yeah, so if you are watching it, or if you, like, are most people familiar with the premise? I guess I should ask that. Yeah, it's like, okay, it's a dating show. It's in its season six now. Um, so the people who are dating, they cannot see each other during, like, the in these, like, introductory periods. They're having these dates. And so it's supposed to, like, cut away all the superficial stuff, and they just get to know each other, like, get to know each other's souls and things like that. Um, so there's this one couple, all right, and, and the man is... Who cares, right? But, but the woman, for some reason, like, decides to tell him that some people think I look like Megan Fox, right? Yeah, and she's super cute. That's not the point, right? But, like, she doesn't look like Megan Fox, okay? Most of us don't, and that's fine, right? So I think if I were on that show, like, in a world where I go on Love is Blonde, all right, let's picture it, okay? I would want to keep expectations really, really low. <laughs> Like, if it ever came up what I looked like, okay? Like, ground level low. I'd be like, hey, do you remember that old cartoon Popeye? <laughs> well, they made a film about it. <laughs> it was directed by Robert Altman. He also directed a 1967 film called Countdown, starring Robert Duvall, who had previously played a character named Boo in an on-screen adaptation of the film, or the novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. And in this film, this character, Boo, 
saved a little child named Scout who was dressed as a ham, and that's what I look like. <laughs> Just so everybody knows. Uh, bumper stickers are kind of sad, am I right? Yeah, bumper stickers are messages to strangers who have not consented to know anything about you. Um, the ones I hate the most are the ones that rely on hypotheticals, like, if you can read this, you're too damn close. First off, watch your language. I am a child, okay? And I'm getting closer to your vehicle to read your special message to me. <laughs> if it is dark out, I'm gonna turn on my high beams, okay? <laughs> um, I do drive a lot. Uh, I drive for like work and stuff and I always use Google Maps, okay? Because I like to like be aware of my surroundings. And I love, like really love, to confirm speed traps, right? Like it feels like a civic duty. Because if you see something, something. say something. And I see a police state. Okay. <laughs> all right, yeah, it's true. It's all right. You don't have to laugh. Um, all right, I'll go out on this. It's going, it was going well, and then it took a turn. Um, all right, I think the first time uh, you give a man a blowjob, if you feel like doing that, okay, you should make this noise. <laughs> Just so he knows you've got that dog in you. <laughs> Maybe I'll put a little peanut butter on there. <laughs> really keep me invested. All right, y'all have been awesome. Thank you so much. My name is Amber Hendricks. I bring Clara back up. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dora. The very funny Amber Hendricks. <laughs> I forgot to mention this when I first got up here, so we'll say I mentioned it then, but I'm mentioning it now. <laughs> Y'all won't tell, right? Um, so guys, I want y'all to follow, if you don't already, Comedy RVA on Instagram. It'll keep you in touch with all the mics and all the shows that are happening in Richmond. If you don't already, which I'm sure all of you do, follow RVA Community Fridges, follow Gold Lion, and follow all the amazing comedians that have come up tonight. We have a great lineup. And I also want to thank Silver Persinger for filming today's show, um, volunteering his time. Give a huge round of applause for him. <laughs> Now this next comedian coming to the stage, she came all the way from New York City. She took the Amtrak here at midnight. Uh, she is very funny. She's only been doing comedy for nine months, but you can see her all over New York at comedy clubs, at bars. She is hilarious. Um, and she's a very unique performer. So let's give a warm welcome to Stephanie Churn. Invited to two big fancy weddings recently. Anybody here get invited to any big fancy weddings? Okay, just me. <laughs> now the concept of a big fancy wedding is like so bizarre to me because when you go to a big fancy wedding, it's a reminder of three things. It's a reminder of our lame asses, of how broke we are and how sad and lonely we are. When you go to a big fancy wedding, you're not going there for the bride and the groom. Fuck them. <laughs> they are happy. We are not. <laughs> they are in love. We are alone. They're making love. We're making tears. When you go to a big fancy wedding, you're going there to have an 
existential crisis about your sad, broke, lonely life. And I'm not afraid to be a shade of a hater at a big fancy wedding too. My favorite drink at a wedding is the haterade. <laughs> because when the bride and the groom start kissing, I boo them. <laughs> when the bride and the groom start making their vows, I heckle them. <laughs> when the bride does a little bouquet, I block it. <laughs> I don't care, I'm a straight up hater. Now when I go to a big fancy wedding, I'm searching for the sliver in time as to when I can give myself permission to take an intermission as to when I can go to like the open buffet <laughs> and steal all the food and put it in my purse when, when, the bride, when everyone's looking at their bride in the room because I'm just a thief too, in a, in a big fancy wedding. Because recently I went to a big fancy wedding of my super rich friend. She's like super rich by the way. Now her wedding was like a wedding out of a movie, you know Crazy Rich Asians. Have you guys seen this movie? Yes. Except with less attractive people. <laughs> like you could have hired some cute people as decorations. <laughs> as I go through my existential dread. Like, you're so rich and privileged, you can't afford the pretty privilege. Now, her wedding was like a wedding from the future. She had like a selfie robot going around taking pictures of people. Then, she had like fireworks, sparklers, and lights. Then, at one point in her wedding, she was just straight up flexing. She got gifted a house, money, and jewelry just to get married. At one point, she was wearing jewelry to cost more country DDB. She didn't even have a flower boy or a flower girl. She had a flower man. Do you know how rich you have to be for a grown man to put on a dress? That's pink. I go frolicking down the aisle for you. You have to be that rich. Now, when it was time for my friend and her husband to do a little dancey dancey with, with each other, I was looking at my friend, right? I was looking at my friend, and I'm like, girl, I should be happy for her, but I'm not, because I'm jealous and I'm bitter. <laughs> I'm looking at her and I was like, girl, why didn't you marry me instead? <laughs> like, I've seen you naked. Like, I make you laugh more than your husband. Who cares about him? Your husband doesn't even eat you out. But me, girl, if you're with me, I will show you a good time. Because I love to eat the rich. Hey, money, money, money! Like, I know you taste like caviar. I know if I drink it, you taste like Moe Champagne. Because every time I go to a big fancy wedding, I can physically sit and walk up in this country. How is it that me and my friend were so close, but yet there's such a gap between us? How is it that she shops at her mess and I still shop at Gap? Only when there's a sales section on top of a clearance. It's a disconnect that makes me really upset. All I'm saying is that each plate of food at her wedding cost $300. And as I was eating my food, I was like, God damn, God damn. The rich taste so goddamn delicious. <laughs> now, who here is like the ugly friend in their friend group? All right, mm -hmm. some of you guys not being honest with yourselves. Ooh, some of you guys ugly. Do you know how you know like you're like the ugly friend in your friend group? When people come up to you and ask about your hot friend. Or when your hot friend's getting hit on and you're starting on the side like this, like this, watching all happen. Because it's not happening to you, it's happening to your hot friend. Or when you go to like a bar or a restaurant and they suddenly give you things for free, it's not you, it's your hot friend. <laughs> or when you go to like a, when you stand online for like a party or to the club and the bouncer lets you skip the line for free, it's not you, it's your hot friend.
But I got hot friends, and I love my hot friends so much. I love my hot friends so much, I love using them for things. Like Cindy, use those God-given looks to get us some things. Like, I love bartering my hot friends in exchange for some goodies. <laughs> like, I don't carry Benjis or Hamiltons in my pocket. I carry hot girls in my pocket. I carry Cindy's and Jenny's in, in my pocket, like they're my currency. Because for once, when I, I cause I feel like with my hot friends, I'll be feeling like a Pokemon trainer. <laughs> <laughs> like call me Ash Ketchum, cause I gotta catch them all. Cause when it's time for a battle, right? I'm just like, ooh, Cindy, I choose you. Get enough free drink. Next battle. <laughs> Kai, I choose you. Flirt with that bouncer for us. Get us into that cup for free, because I don't want to pay for that cover fee. Anyone like Mary here tonight? Okay, fine. Because <laughs> my, my friend's getting a divorce. <laughs> and my other half friend happened to know one. So we're like, ooh, Mora, we choose you. Avab. Get us those divorce papers. Give us Cindy's freedom from her ugly ass. No good having ass. Still stays with his parents' ass of a husband. That's me roasting my friend's husband because I don't like him. Because me, I do absolutely nothing. I just reap the benefits of labor on my half friends like a straight up capitalist. <laughs> just supporting the values of this, of this country, no big deal. Like for one second to feel like bourgeoisie in this country. I'm tired of this proletariat worker's life. And that's why I love my hot friends. And that's why you should get you some hot friends. Unless you're the hot friend. But some of you guys are not, so please take my advice. Thank you guys! <laughs> Talented Will Miner. We keep it going for time, everybody. Come on! They let me carry heavy things and then they say, get on the stage and tell some yuck yucks. Come on. <laughs> get your ass up there. Keep going for Stephanie, everybody. Come on, all the way from New York City. They love their hot friends and they eat pussy at the marriage. I pay attention. I was listening. I'm supportive. Hell yeah. Well, I guess a little bit about me. I'm an Aquarius. Any other Aquarius out there? Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Holy hellbenders, I'm alone. Oh my. Well, that's okay. I saw one person raise your hand back there. That's okay. That matches up with an Aquarius. See if you agree with this. I actually Googled the resume for that job. You can Google the qualifications. I Googled it and I found out that apparently Aquarius, see if you agree with this. Aquarius are very moody, very self-reliant, and we have trouble looking people in the eye. Would you say that's true? Yeah. I don't because I don't know about you, friend. I read that description and I was like, holy shit! I'm not an Aquarius, I'm autistic. <laughs> this whole time. Wow, this guy's a little bit bluer. This guy is just a little bit bluer. Any mental disorders out there? We got any mental disorders? Hell yeah. Righteous, where are my depressed people at? Let's hear from the depression. Where's my anxiety people? Come on, anxiety. Where Okay, that normally kills with a Baptist crowd. Lutherans, got it. I feel you, Methodists. Right on. <laughs> I love opening my shows with that bit, though. I like seeing how people react. The depressed people are always like, eh, I guess. Anxious people are like, yeah, maybe. Bipolar people are like, eh, yeah, ignore the way. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and uh, they were expressing to me, Will, I have seasonal depression. I have seasonal, anybody here have seasonal depression? A friend of mine was saying to me, Will, I have seasonal depression. You have no idea what that's like. Do you have any idea how hard it is to have seasonal depression? And I said, no, friend. But actually, audience, I found a way to beat 
seasonal depression. Y'all want to know how I beat seasonal depression? Yeah. I'm always depressed. <laughs> Take that, big pharma. Here's mud in your eye, Hitler. <laughs> Fuck you, Pol Pot. I don't know. <laughs> I just like talking like that. <sighs> I've got a big butt. I've got a big butt. Anybody else? Big butts? <laughs> nice, the Aquarius guy. Hell yeah. <laughs> I like you more and more, friend. <laughs> Got a lot in common. It's hard having a big butt. It's hard. It's hard out there. Always having a big butt. Sometimes chairs are uncomfortable. Whatever I walk by people, they go, damn. <laughs> people are always dropping pencils in front of me and saying, why don't you pick that up, Will? Why don't you pick up that pencil for us? Okay, just me. <laughs> I think I have a butt, uh, big butt, because I like to ride my, uh, I like to ride my bike a lot. I ride my bike all over the city. Any other cyclists out there? Cyclists in the audience? Yeah. Right on. <laughs> cool. I feel like I'm on a bike right now, and you all are in cars passing me. This is. <laughs> I feel like you all are very frustrated because I'm in the lane, <laughs> and I will not get over. <laughs> I'm not going to stop at the stop sign. <laughs> I know I'm the worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine, I was saying I, I like to bike to all my shows, and they were like, Will, if you had to get hit by a car, Will, if you were going to get hit by a car, what kind of car would you want to get hit by? And I was like, an ambulance. <laughs> you shake your head no? What? That's the perfect scenario. Can you imagine it? They hit me. They get out of the car, they're like, holy shit. We didn't have to call. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I just like, you know, I like to help, you know, the ambulance people. I also like to, it's a very, uh-oh, like, oh, blah, 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 there, we're back. Very professional. I like to bike to all the, like I said, I like to bike to all my gigs, a lot of bars and breweries, very bikeable city. Although I do gotta warn you, Richmond, you gotta be careful. I notice you get, you always get the same look whether you're biking to a bar or whether you're biking away from a bar. People just look at you and they're just like, wow, that guy, that guy definitely has a DUI. Uh, <laughs> Like, that's, that's not cardio, that's court-ordered. Someone had to tell... Someone had to tell that gentleman to do that. Oh, boy. Gosh, how do I segue this one? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> how do I segue this one? Uh, uh, Hamas. I thought it was pronounced hummus. <laughs> I know, I'm the worst. I'm so full of... I know, well, stop talking about the thing that's on the TV, the news, the Twitter, and everything. I don't know, I'm kind of a weirdo. I'm one of those weirdos. I think people can get along. I think most people can get along. I generally think most people get along. Like, one of my best friends, no joke, one of my best friends, Palestinian, he was like, well, I want to take you to mosque. I want you to come to a mosque with me. Be a good time. So I went to mosque audience, and before I go any further, are there any Christians in the audience? Any Catholics? Any Protestants? Okay, holy shit. Oh my gosh. Mosque was just like a Catholic mass. It was just like a huge game of Simon Says. It was awesome. Like when you get into the big service room, like everybody gets shoulder to shoulder, the imam gets up on stage and he's like, Allah says everybody kneel, and then everybody would kneel, and then he says, Allah says everybody stand up, so everybody would stand up, and then he pauses and he goes, everybody kneel, and then one guy would kneel and he'd be like, I didn't say Allah said, oh, God is great, God is good, but you know, in Muslim. Uh, also, fellas, they make all the chicks sit in the back. Hey, -oh. I didn't ask them to do that. I just went. Like, you know, I didn't mean like in the church. I was like, get all these women in the back. I gotta pray. <laughs> all right, religious crowd. Right on. Well, thank you all for putting up with me. Let's get Tara back up here. Thank you all so much. Are we having a good time? Woo! Awesome. Y'all are gonna love the next comedian coming to the stage. She is so good at comedy that she actually teaches it at Coalition Theater. And they have a showcase coming up on the 16th um, that is going to be very funny, so y'all should come out to Coalition. Um, this person's a very good friend of mine, and she is absolutely hilarious. Let's bring up the very funny Nadine Donaghy. Yeah, how are we doing tonight? Having a good time? Yeah, so you guys have a great vibe. Uh, uh, I like this restaurant. There's really good food here. Have people ordered? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I have to, I'm trying to be careful what I eat, you guys. I'm doing one of those, like, newer fad-type diets. It is anorexia. 
but we call it intermittent fasting now. <laughs> uh, it's been the worst, a real nightmare, because I had to do it for months and months before I saw any type of results. And then by results, I pretty much just mean that like my breast and my butt have been shrinking while my cookie pocket holds out stronger than a church girl on prom night. <laughs> Uh, the other day I was at the grocery store and I was thinking about getting a cake and, and by that I mean that I had like three cakes in my cart and I was just trying to pick which cake I was gonna get. I usually like to go with a birthday style cake because they'll write your name on that for free. And I just like a nice non-verbal way to be like, I'm not trying to share this cake. <laughs> Uh, but I was, I was really craving black forest cake, that's what I wanted, and they only have it in the small. I was like, perfect, because I'm nothing if not controlled when preparing to consume an entire cake. <laughs> uh, you know, some people, they let their vices consume them, but no, I like to consume my vices because I'm proactive. <laughs> but yeah, I was getting this little cake, and as I'm putting it in the cart, I noticed that it has 1,200 calories. Uh, which is a whole day's worth of calories, but I mean, it's a whole cake, so fair enough. <laughs> what made me mad, though, was that was almost the same number of calories that were in the Caesar salad kit that I had in the cart. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I liked her shock. She, she was with me. No, it's true. Just because of the salad dressing. Like, man, salad dressing. Definitely invented by someone with a fetish and an agenda. <laughs> You have literally debased yourself to the point where you're just eating like leaves and grass in an attempt to be healthy. And then this jerk comes along and is like, hey, what if I told you with a couple spoonfuls of this, we can make that barely palatable and get you back up to entire cake numbers. <laughs> I mean, that is just the purest form of irony. <laughs> it's like throwing a charity ball. It's like, yes, let's throw the fanciest party we can. We would not want to risk that money ending up somewhere silly, like in the hands of the needy. <laughs> no, you guys get it. Because I, because that's what I like about this crowd, is all you guys, you care about other people. That's why you're here donating to Community Fridges, which is a great organization. I love to be a part of it. Uh, I think it's good in general to do charity work. It's good for your heart. I, I went to the Red Cross the other day to try to donate blood. They, they have that tagline they use, like one donation could save three lives, one bag of blood for three people, which sounds like vampire rationing during wartime. <laughs> but it did, it got me in the door. I was like, listen, if I can save all of Destiny's child, I will make some time. <laughs> if every Powerpuff Girl is waiting for me, I can spare an afternoon. <laughs> and I get there. She took my iron, which they have to stab you in the finger for, by the way. So like already not the bargain deal that got me in the door. Because <laughs> uh, now at best you're stabbing me twice to save three people. And is that worth it? No. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, she takes my iron. It was too low. She was like, you know what? It's okay. We'll just keep going and then we'll come back to that. Takes my blood pressure. It's not right either. She's like, it's, it's okay. We'll keep going. I was like, you are very thirsty for my blood, ma'am. <laughs> like, I feel both your first test and we're still going. <laughs> yeah, she, she weighed me, which felt more hostile than when she had stabbed me. <laughs> and yeah, and then she takes my iron yet again. Guess what? Your iron doesn't change in five minutes. <laughs> So it was still too low. And as I'm about to leave, the thought occurs to me that I was like, oh, you know what? I just got off my period. Do you think maybe that's why my iron is low? And she goes, uh, yeah. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> like, first off, I am a hero. <laughs> Second off, I'm sorry that I'm not a medical professional and that I thought that my body had learned to compensate for this thing it's done 236 months in a row. <laughs> Some of you out there are like, is she that old? That's the real math. I, math plays a real part in my comedy. <laughs> no, I, it blew my mind. You know, I, to be fair, I feel like some people tense up when we talk about stuff like this. It's like, ah, periods, it makes people feel weird. Guys, I feel about periods the way that men feel about pornography. It is too funny not to joke about. <laughs> to, although I will say, people do. They do a lot of period jokes. You know what doesn't get talked about as often is ovulation. 
And that is also weird. That's like when you're at your most fertile and it comes with some weird things. Like, not all of it's bad though. It's definitely when I look my best. Like, clear skin, good hair days, zero bloating. My body is not even subtle when it's trying to trap somebody. <laughs> it's a weird, and you know what? I will say that's the best time to make a pass at me too. It really is, cause that egg drops and so do my standards. <laughs> Like, my hormones catch a real accepting all applicants type attitude that is unsettling. Uh, you, know, you know what's weird to me is when you see a couple and the guy, like, knows his girl's cycle better than she does. Have you guys ever seen this? It's weird to me. I, whenever I see it, I'm like, who in the world asked you to provide this service? Uh, some women, they like it, though, because the guy will, like, buy them chocolates and things like that. But uh, I buy my own chocolate because I'm a strong, independent woman, and nobody loves me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not very good at dating in general. Uh, my longest relationship, the guy who I dated for the longest, was a cancer. Um, that was like a sun sign, cancer. Is it rude if I call myself a cancer survivor? <laughs> no, we dated for a while. Uh, when we hit our two year mark of dating, he tried to give me a promise ring. Uh, you guys, he was 35. <laughs> like, you have missed the promise ring when nobody. <laughs> The last acceptable age to give someone a promise ring is like 18, and that is if you are Mormon and going on a mission. <laughs> he did. I was like, you know, I'm not really in a very promising kind of mood right now. I will take that ring though if you want. <laughs> and uh, I did. I got it sized for my middle finger. This is it. <laughs> um, some of you out there are probably like, Nadine, that's so rude. You know what else is rude? Asking a full-grown woman you've been dating for two years if she wants to get pretend engaged. <laughs> <sighs> no, I'm not, I'm not good at dating. I, I did go on an accidental date the other day. Uh, that is, it's like a date, but where only one person knew it was about to happen. <laughs> I was hanging out with a comedian in between shows, and we went out to get food. And I knew that everything had changed because he paid for my pizza. And like, I, you know, I feel like some of you probably know what I mean by this, but if there's any like sweethearted, doe-eyed innocent out there who's like, Nadine, maybe he was just trying to be nice. Hmm. Men are not nice. <laughs> 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 Sorry if I'm breaking any hearts. <laughs> uh, no, but he did, he paid for my pizza. And then he was just saying like the wildest stuff. He was telling me about his new job. He'd just gotten a promotion. He was excited about that. But he was like, yeah, I love this job. It's my favorite. I've been fired from every other job I've had. <laughs> and I, I made some type of face. I mean, I'm sure it was a muted version because like he was right there. But you know, uh, and he goes, no, no, not for like being mean, just for being lazy. <laughs> And then this man goes, is that a red flag? <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, no. Men do, they say the darndest things. Like, I had a guy the other day who I hadn't even known 24 hours say to me, Nadine, you must get sent dick pics. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> this is the face of a narc if ever you saw one. <laughs> like, the closest to anything like that that I've ever had is that I was hanging out at a guy's house and we were just friends, I thought. He had never made any romantic like overture towards me at all. And we we're watching a movie and just in the middle of the movie, out of nowhere, he goes to his room, comes back out with no shirt on. I just like stared down his cat that was sitting on my lap. I finally understood what an emotional support animal is. <laughs> Just stared that cat down until this man made the walk of shame back into his room and came back out with a shirt on. We both acted like nothing had happened. <laughs> uh, and yeah, some of you out there are probably like, okay, but like, how do you look? Uh, definitely like he should have been trying to win me over with his personality. <laughs> uh, but when I do date now, I try to date guys who aren't very emotional. I just feel like it means more when you eventually bring them to tears. <laughs> and if anyone's like, come on, so much work to get these men into actual tears. 
Uh, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> All right, thanks, you guys. does what she loves and loves what she does. Okay, so this next comedian, he's your second Taylor of the night. Oh. Yes, after our amazing Taylor Scott, the founder of RV Community Fridges. And I asked him, I said, Taylor, how do you want me to bring you up tonight? And he said, Tara, I'm just some dude. So please, but I promise you he's very funny. He's at shows all over the city, um, and he is hilarious. Please welcome to the stage the very funny Taylor O'Sullivan. It is finicky. Holy shit. How are y'all doing? This is awesome. You guys are so hot. You guys are so sexy. I was in Williamsburg yesterday. <laughs> Good day, sir. Would you like some tea? Here it's like, yo, and I'm like, should we go back to my place? This is awesome. I do drive a lot. I drive a lot for work, and have y'all noticed that like city billboards are built different than country billboards? Like city, board, city, city billboards are like, we're fighting cancer. And then country billboards are like, where are you going? <laughs> Heaven? or hell. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to my friend Mike's house <laughs> to kill him, <laughs> stab him to death. <laughs> but this is fun. Uh, do you guys know those uh, one wheels? Have you seen those around Richmond? Uh, they're like a skateboard, but they have one wheel. They're aptly named, as you can tell. My friend has one, and we were at a party last weekend, and he was walking around like it with it, and he was trying to hit on these girls in a group, and he was like, I love my one wheel. I don't know if I'll ever go back to driving four wheels. <laughs> and I was like, Patrick, the courts decided a year ago that you no longer allowed to drive <laughs> four wheels. You have a DUI. <laughs> you guys probably can't tell, but I'm trying to grow a mustache. I said, thank you, Taylor. T-Squad, that's what I say. I'm trying to grow a mustache and it's not really going great. Like, my coworker, Daryl, the other day, Daryl was like, Taylor, how long have you been growing that mustache? And I was like, three weeks. And Daryl was like, I could grow a better mustache than you in three days. Which is mean, but even meaner because Daryl is a 65-year-old lady. <laughs> But at the office, people do say that stuff to me. Like, I was talking to two coworkers, my boss, Georgia, and my coworker, Lauren. And Georgia's like, Taylor, your mustache makes you look distinguished. It makes, look, makes you look like you are five years older. And then Lauren was like, Taylor, your mustache makes you look like you keep five-year-olds in your basement. <laughs> Which is mean, but also kind of nice to think that she thinks I have enough money to afford a house. <laughs> With a basement? <laughs> it's amazing. That's the American dream. <laughs> this is fun. This is really cool. Uh, I really hate cliches. Like my boss the other day, she was like, Taylor, here's a project. Just give it your college try. <laughs> I hate that phrase. Give it your college try. Because my college try was smoking weed for three years and then disappointing my dad. <laughs> So yeah, I'm giving my college try, and in a couple of weeks I'll be fired. Uh, another phrase I hate is the phrase, see something, say something. I think it should be, see something, say something, sometimes. <laughs> like my fiance, we're in the grocery store, grocery store the other day, and I saw a woman walk by, and I go, damn. Don't say something, is what I'm saying. Do not say something. The Olympics are coming up. I, I love the Olympics personally. I love diving. I love swimming. I think it's awesome. They're all half naked, and I am horny. Uh, 
But did you know that they give out 10,000 condoms at the Olympic Village? Those aren't the people we should be giving condoms to. <laughs> they should be giving condoms to people like me. Those people are our future Avengers, is what I'm saying. You take Usain Bolt and some archer, and that is Hawkeye in the future. All right, this is cool. I am getting married. I'm excited. Uh, but my fiance, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we watch a lot of shitty TV, excuse my language, we watch a lot of bad TV, and uh, do you guys know the TV, sh the movie Taken? Do you remember that movie with Liam Neeson? If you don't, Liam Neeson's daughter gets kidnapped and sold to Eastern Europe. And my fiance pauses the movie and says, Taylor, if I got kidnapped, would you come to Eastern Europe and save me? <laughs> and I was like, Riley, I love you. I don't have a passport. <laughs> All right, guys, my name's Taylor Sullivan. Keep going for your host, Tara. California. Stay with me here. Okay. They notice that the thermostat is ticking up, 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 up. It's getting hot inside this mansion, right? Luckily for them, an air conditioning salesman is walking down the street. He knocks on their door. Would you like to buy an air conditioning unit? The beautiful Russian model who opens the door says, no, we do only fans. Aww. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just turned 26 last week. Yeah, which means I've now received all the health care I'll ever receive. Um, so I'm really focusing on how to make myself better without the help of a doctor. Um, the best way I found to do that was I actually quit smoking. Yeah, thank you. For real, for real. Uh, and I quit cold turkey, too. Yeah, and one of my best friends was like, Emily, you shouldn't quit cold turkey. And honestly, on day three, I started to agree with them because not only did I crave nicotine, but I couldn't take the edge off with my favorite lunch meat from the fridge. <laughs> cold turkey, everybody. Um, now that I'm 26, I started getting these ads on Instagram. Maybe you have gotten them too. They say, you should become an egg donor. <laughs> and I'm like, what about me looks like I raise hens, okay? <laughs> and have enough to spare, like I would donate them, okay? In today's economy. Um, not for real, they want my human eggs. They want my human eggs, um, which really surprises me, right? Because if the Instagram algorithm knows that I'm, number one, a human who has eggs, and number two, that those eggs are harvestable, then the Instagram algorithm also must know that one-third of my Google searches result in the words, help is available. <laughs> right? Like, I don't think my eggs should be donated. I think that Goodwill would reject my eggs. The Salvation Army would reject my eggs. Everybody, um, I moved to Richmond in 2016 uh, to pursue a college degree at the University of Richmond. That's right. I majored in uh, entitlement. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I very quickly learned after I graduated that one of the highest compliments I could receive is, oh my god, you don't look like you went there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It's hard to be a Lydia Dietz in a room full of Heathers. It's very freeing to become a Lydia Dietz in a city full of Lydia Dietzes, am I right? You know, like, I drive a silver Subaru. I used to live in the fan. There was one time I, like, nicked the back of my neighbor's car. They had a camera. They said, a silver Subaru hit my, girl, hit my car. Some girl with box, box-dyed black hair was driving. And, you know, which one? Which one is it? Which one is it? Am I right? Um, I love Richmond, though. I love Richmond. I love that the water is fortified with Pabst Blue Ribbon. Um, I love that if I were ever, you know, to be held at gunpoint somewhere, and the person pointing the gun at me said, I'll let you go if you can draw an anatomically correct scorpion. I could pull just about anybody off the street and they could show me one of their tattoos and help me out, you know? I like that it's a friendly community like that. Um, I also love the music scene in Richmond, you know? Like, I, lo I, love, I love the hardcore bands, I love the punk bands, I like pretending that they're all different. Um, <laughs> You know, I especially love listening to music in my car. Anyone else? Woo, yeah. Listen to music in your car? Yeah, um, I noticed that my sound system was kind of fading on me, so I was asking around to my friends. I was like, you know, what, what kind of sound system should I get? One of my friends was like, you should get a Panasonic. The sound is crispy, it's beautiful. My other friend was like, no, 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 get a Sony. Their warranty is unbeatable. And I was like, Guys, I'm disappointed in you because I was brought up not to believe in stereotypes. Aww. Oh, I love when a crowd goes, oh, <laughs> to my jokes. That just gets me. Um, I love karaoke too. Karaoke, guys, my go to karaoke song uh, it's a little ditty by Carly Simon. It's called You're So Vain, right? You're so vain, you probably think this joke is about you, right? I like this one particular song in the joke. It goes, I had some dreams. They were clouds in my coffee. And at first I was like, that's deep. And then I was like, you know what? I don't think those were dreams. That's cream in your coffee. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, I date. <laughs> I totally date. I know what you guys are thinking. She doesn't date. Um, you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong, everybody. I made a decision a long time ago not to date any other stand-up comics, you know, because they already have a tight five. Uh -huh. um, but I, I will tell you about the most recent date I went on. Um, for the purposes of this joke, we'll just call this guy Lucky, right? Uh, and you know, like we do normal things when we go on dates. Like we like to go on long walks. We like to enjoy a delicious meal together. Everything was going fine until one day, he, uh, he shows me this jar of organic peanut butter. And he's like, oh baby, I wanna rub this peanut butter all over you and then lick it off. And I'm like, my folks raised me right, I don't have a nut allergy. Let's go for it. Let's go for it, right? So we go for it, and it goes really well until a few days later, the guy's dirty talking to me, right? He's like, oh baby, I can't wait to do that thing with the peanut butter again. Can't wait to lick that peanut butter out of your Kong. And I realize that he means my like sacred Kong. <laughs> and I had to put him down. Yeah, the men in Richmond are dogs, everybody. They're dogs. Um, anyone have any like irrational fears in the audience? Yes. You're nodding, <laughs> kind of in an accepting way. What do you want to share? There's too many. Okay, does anyone just have one irrational fear in the audience? 
Sharks. Yeah? Sharks. Sharks? Yeah. Do you spend much time in shark infested waters? Never. 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 Okay, so you can like kind of rule it out, right? Exactly. Right? Why exactly, exactly. My fear is kind of tough because I'm afraid of getting shots, right? Anyone else? It's just like a part of life. Um, you know, it scares me because it's become really difficult to carry all of those tiny glasses from the bar back to my friends at the table. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I have a consumer complaint. I consume things sometimes. Um, the other day I purchased a bag of bird seed. I read all of the instructions on the back of the package. I've waited one full week and I haven't grown a single bird. <laughs> it's pretty fucked up. Um, I will leave you on this one. I have decided I don't want any children. Yeah, um, because I don't really understand the way they talk. <laughs> For example, um, I have a 16-year-old cousin, and she has, you know, her own vocabulary that I don't really understand, right? Like the other day, um, I was telling her some really fantastic things that I have coming up in the comedy community that I'm excited about, and she just texted me back the capital letter L. I don't really know what that means. Um, she's always saying stuff is Bussin, but like, I don't think the girl has ever stepped foot on public transport. And like the other day, right, um, me and her and my aunt and my mom, a bunch of other folks in my family were going to a petting zoo as a little fun family outing, you know, to see the chickens and the geese and the ducks and the goats and the, and the turkeys and the cows and all the friendly animals, right? We drive like two hours out to Western Virginia to go to this famous petting zoo, right? Send this 16-year-old cousin out to the front to buy us all tickets. We wait a few minutes and she comes back. She's kind of dejected. She's upset. She says, the petting zoo is closed. We're like, are you serious? What's wrong? She says, dead ass. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Emily Erblin. Please give it up for your host, Tara. Emily Erblin, everyone. Woo! Now we are down to your final comedian of the evening. How are we feeling, everyone? Woo! So this person, he is hilarious. He is uh, the host of the Big City Comedy Show, just like the ones they have in New York at Coalition Theater. It is a great show. Y'all should come out and see it. And he is so good at comedy that he's teaching not the 101, but the Comedy 201 Classic Coalition, so you can learn how to emulate his comedic stylings by taking the class, which starts, I believe, in March. Let's bring to the stage with a warm welcome the very funny Randolph Washington Jr. Let's keep it going for Tara. We're in the killer show here. Um, also, let's make some other other comics. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is a really, really good show. They're hard, they're, uh, tough to find. I know you guys were like, this is a comedy show, and then they introduced me, and they're like, why is a beatnik poet uh, headlining the comedy show? Yeah, I didn't dress like this on purpose, but like when I got here, Amber pointed out immediately, and I was like, oh no. Um, but yeah, I, I promise not to do any spoken word up here, um, unless you guys don't laugh. Um, then it'll all, all be a punishment. <laughs> Um, this is my first time at Gold Line, and I really like it. Like, it's really, uh, it's a really cool place. It's like, the atmosphere, yeah. cute. Like, the food, tasty. The employees, hot. <laughs> did, did anyone else notice? Like, not an uggo in the bunch. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they had to put in, like, headshots when they applied. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, so, uh, my, well, actually, I'll talk about my family a little bit. 
So uh, my brother and his wife, uh, a few years back, they moved from uh, Tennessee to Massachusetts because uh, they wanted a new flavor of racism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now my brother, he's training for the Boston Run. Uh, not the marathon, the run. That's where you try, try to get from your seat at Fenway Stadium to your parking spot without being hate crimed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, so my brother, he is indeed uh, married to a white woman. Uh, so sometimes I feel the pressure to one day marry a black man. <laughs> yeah, because that way combined, we can make one son our parents are proud of. <laughs> I'm always told to stress that as a joke. My parents are very accepting and very loving. They love their white daughter-in-law. They're super accepting of me being gay. My dad was super accepting when I came out of the closet. Um, I think partly because he had just beat cancer and God can only answer so many prayers. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he, ch he chose life. Um, uh, uh, when I uh, came out, my mom, she wasn't too surprised. And like, like last Christmas, I actually asked her, like, hey, like, why weren't you surprised when I came out of the closet? And she said, well, do you remember uh, in fourth grade when a bunch of your female friends for the talent show decided to dance to a Spice Girl song? And you choreographed it? <laughs> There were some signs. <laughs> but uh, speaking of mine, actually, uh, let's also make some noise for our RVA community fridges. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, organization. Uh, it reminds me a lot of my mom, because like at my home church uh, uh, in, in Charlottesville, uh, we have like, a food bank. My mom was in charge of running it for like many, many years. And I remember her talking about how like the food bank wasn't just for like the people in poverty, and just for the homeless, even though it was for them too. It's also for anyone, because like anyone can have a bad week, anyone can, one short, you know, you, you gotta choose between paying the bills or buying groceries, and places like the community fridges and food banks help out with that. I don't have a joke for that, I just think it's really nice that you guys do that kind of work, so. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. right. Well, now that you think I'm a good person, let's go back to the jokes. <laughs> um, uh, so I love uh, conspiracy theories. Yes. And there was this conspiracy theory a few years ago that I was obsessed with, I thought it was amazing. Uh, so super far right people, they thought liberals were pushing critical race theory in schools to make white kids hate themselves so much that they turned gay out of spite. <laughs> and I gotta say, the logic is sound. <laughs> Because you see, like, I was raised to be a feminist, and I learned to hate men so much that I started sleeping with the enemy. Uh, but of course, of course, you can't make someone gay because being gay is what? A choice. Uh, yeah, I chose financial freedom. Uh, children are expensive. They're like 500 bucks a month or something. I don't know, it's wild. Uh, um, but yeah, obviously being gay isn't a choice. Um, what actually made me gay was Power Rangers. Um, specifically the Red Power Ranger. Even more specifically when the Red Power Ranger would wear a tank top and I could see like this muscle, this right here. Like I don't know what that muscle's called. I think maybe the homozoid or something, but... Yeah, that's what ignited it. Like, like they need to stop like banning drag queens and ban muscly men in tank tops, okay? Like, all you men start covering up. All right. Um, <laughs> let's be real. Let's be honest. We really know the real reason that I'm gay. The one true reason that I'm a homosexual man is that, like, I made too many women come. You know, it's just like I was forced into early retirement. <laughs> you know, I was, I was doing LeBron numbers, honestly. Uh, <laughs> at one point, uh, you know, an agent from the NSA showed up at my door. That's what NSA stands for, not street anymore. Um, and he said, like, Randolph, you smoke too hard, you swag too different, you're, bit, you're too bad. Like, um, yeah, so if any women in the audience are still straight, it's because you're not trying hard enough. Um, <laughs> um, I mentioned Power Rangers earlier, and I'm gonna bring it right back. Uh, some of you might not know this, uh, unless you have kids, Power Rangers is still on the air. 
there's someone making that show. And I watched one of the most recent seasons and I was shocked because like when I was a kid, the villain was like a witch from the outer space who wanted to conquer the earth or a robot from outer space who wanted to conquer the earth or a ninja from outer space who wanted to conquer the earth because they really wanted us to hate aliens for some reason. It's like the governor of Texas made Power Rangers, I don't know. But the villain for this most recent season, and I am not joking, is a weapons manufacturer who wanted to start a war so they could sell the weapons to all sides, all sides, right? Like, like when we were kids, we learned about like teamwork and friendship. These kids were learning about warmongering. Um, uh, and even better yet, uh, the the villain, her name is yes, her girl boss. Um, <laughs> Her name is Bajillia Nair. And I love that like, they're, they're teaching kids to hate the rich. <laughs> like, can't be mad at that. Like, Power Rangers is gonna turn out a whole generation of gay communists, and I'm here for it. <laughs> um, all right, I'll pivot a little bit. Um, anyone here a uh, Taylor Swift fan? Make some noise, make some noise. Anyone here a Taylor Swift hater? Uh, okay. <laughs> I gotta say, I used to be amongst you, I used to be a hater, until I realized like how important her work was, you know? Woo! And by her work, I don't mean her music. And I don't mean her acting, obviously. <laughs> what I mean, of course, is her charity work. And that charity work is, of course, keeping white women occupied. Because <laughs> like, they are a very powerful force. And I truly believe uh, if it wasn't for Taylor Swift, there would have been three times as many white women at January 6th. <laughs> and the country would have fallen. So yeah, I don't really think of her as a pop star, I think of her as a patriot. And I really feel like if you ever meet Taylor Swift, don't ask for a photograph, don't ask for an autograph, just salute. <laughs> um, anyone here ever heard of Catholicism? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I wasn't raised Catholic. Uh, I had a friend who was uh, recently um, converted and he's like exploring Christianity. I was like, that's cool. I, I love anyone exploring their faith and stuff. But then I found like he converted to Catholicism. And I was like, that's like the worst one. <laughs> it's like you gotta do extra homework and everything. Um, but I wanted to be a good friend. So I decided I'm gonna learn a little bit about Catholicism. And um, let me tell you, Catholic mythology is super neat. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I don't know like, if you guys remember like the phases when you went when you were a kid, like in elementary school, you, you were obsessed with like Egyptian mythology, and then in middle school you get obsessed with Greek mythology, and then in high school you get obsessed with gay sex. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm starting it over again with the Catholic mythology. It's pretty nifty. They have these things called saints. Um, I don't know if you heard about them. Saints, they're really cool. It's like this this combination of like Christianity and Pokemon. <laughs> Cause girl, they got a saint for everything. Um, and I, like, uh, a lot of times the saints, uh, the way they're portrayed in art is how they died, um, which is like a little rude, honestly. Um, like St. Lucy, her eyes were plucked out. So she's someone walking around with like her eyes on a tray. Like she's like a server at a casino, just like drinks, cigarettes, eyeballs. And then St. Stephen, he was stoned to death, right? And so he's stoned just like with stones sitting on his head. And I, if I was saying Stephen, I'd be so mad. <laughs> like, I'd be like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm switching to a different religion. Thank you very much. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the one thing is that like sometimes the how they die is ties to like what they be the saint of. So Saint Lucy, eyes plucked out. She's a saint, patron saint of the blind. Okay, that makes sense. But then uh, Saint Stephen, he was stoned to death, right? and they made him the patron saint of stonemasons. Right? Stonemasons? That is so rude. Okay, um, like, that's like making like, I don't know, the patron saint of air travel, Buddy Holly. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of you who laughed, thank you for being uh, born before 2000. Uh, yeah. I told that joke at a college show and it uh, didn't, no one, no one knew what was going on. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite saints is uh, Peter, uh, Saint Bartholomew. 
uh, he uh, was skinned alive. And in the artwork, he's shown um, as a, a being of muscle, and he has, he's wearing his own skin as a shawl, because he was kind of like Catholic's first fashion girly. <laughs> um, but then, like, let's just guess, let's just guess. What do you think, shout it out, what do you think they made him the patron saint of? Butchers. Right, butchers, yes! They made him the patron saint of butchers. That is rude. I feel like, I feel like that's like if I, got like, I don't know, lynched, right? And then you made me the patron saint of neckties. <laughs> All right, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go out on this. Uh, anyone here ever have sex with a white person? Yeah, yeah it's an increasingly popular hobby. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've done it once or twice, and it's fun because some of you might not know this, but throughout the year, white people change color. They have different shades. Um, yeah, they're like ferrets in that way. Um, and I remember uh, one time I was uh, hooking up with a white guy, and I started laughing, which you shouldn't do. Uh, and he goes, what's wrong? And I said, like, oh, there's nothing wrong. It's just like, when I look down, it looks like I'm balls deep in Neapolitan ice cream. That's my dumbest joke, and I love it. But yeah, it's, it's been a great audience. Um, uh, like uh, Tara said, uh, the next show of the Big City Comedy Show is at March 2nd, and if you're interested in taking stand-up 101 or 201, you can check it out at rvacomedy.com. You've been a great audience. Have a great night. Keep going for your host. You guys, what? before I let this headliner leave the stage, what? I have asked him to do an encore of my favorite joke of maybe all time. Okay. So y'all are in for a very special treat, one final joke from Randolph Washington Jr. Uh, you know, it's funny uh, because this is not the first time this joke has been requested by someone. <laughs> I guess, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a hit, okay. Has uh, anyone here uh, ever heard the term super gay before? It was used online for like a few years. And right, you said, Root, it sounds awesome, right? Um, like it sounds like someone who gets super strength from sniffing poppers. Uh, but like, unfortunately, it's terrible. The term super gay was a term that cis uh, gay, usually men, would use um, to refer to themselves because they had never dated or had sex with a trans person. Yeah, and they were like proud of this. It's like, wow, you're so gay, you keep back around to being a bigot. Um, but I want to, first of all, make it very clear, I'm not a member of that community. I've dated trans guys before, well, again, in the future. Uh, I do remember, like, the first time I hooked up with a trans guy. I didn't do a great job. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the, the equipment, but Washingtons are not quitters, okay? So first step, I went to Reddit for advice. That was the wrong place to go. But then um, I befriended uh, the USA women's soccer team, and they had a lot of great tips. <laughs> yeah, so like the next time we hooked up, he received a noise complaint, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, and like, it is like wild how like, like, like cis gay men will like be bu bully, like be transphobic. I remember there was this like gay porn star, a cis guy who hooked up, who did a video with a trans porn star, and there were gay men bullying the porn star and, and calling him bisexual, like it's an insult. <laughs> and it's like, dude, first of all, being bi is fine. Second of all, like we know he's not bisexual, he's gay, because like during the video, the background music wasn't Mitski. <laughs> I love it when there's enough queers in the audience to <laughs> that joke to work. Um, and but most of all, I feel it's annoying because like I feel like they're using the term "super gay" incorrectly, right? Because like a little bit about me. On three separate occasions, I was attracted to someone who, at the time, I thought was a woman. So it was like cool. I remember in my bisexual era. And then all three of these people later came out as trans men. So it turns out I'm not bisexual. I'm just psychic. <laughs> and I really truly feel like. If anyone should be called super gay, it's the man who's so gay, he can see the future. <laughs> All right, thank you guys.
picture of this packed room, so can we get everyone to cheer? I'll take a great photo of you all. Amazing, some beautiful, beautiful faces. Um, thank you all for coming, feel free to hang around, and if you were a comic who performed on the show tonight, please come up for a group picture. Yes. Thank you all so much, have a great night!